All right, today is May the 25th in 2023, and my guest is Alexander Bard. Alex is a Swedish cyber philosopher, futurologist, and the author of several books, including The Netocrats, The Global Empire, The Body Machines, and Syntheism, Creating God in the Internet Age, together with Jan Soderquist. He's also a former music producer, artist, and entrepreneur. We're going to have an eclectic and open conversation about music, philosophy, and the evolution of humanity influenced by technology and wherever else the conversation takes us. So, Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Nicholas. Alex, what were the key inflection points in your life that got you to where you are now or that give our listeners a good sense of who you are? Uh, okay, I knew I'd always become an artist, and I grew up in a very artistic family. We were five kids, mixed cultural backgrounds. Um, and, and I did drama and theater in my 20s and, and then moved on to the music industry and had a career as a music producer, songwriter, artist in the international music industry for 25 years. But I always knew that I had more in me than just making the music and writing the songs and all that. And that was my interest in philosophy. The thing, though, with philosophy is that you can't really be sure you have anything important to say in the times you live because, you know, um, philosophy has to be absolutely novel. If you're just repeating other people's philosophies, you just, uh, uh, you know, you're just a teacher of philosophy. You're not a philosopher. So philosophy is an art form. And I was looking for, is there anything happening during my lifetime that could be of such importance that actually I should get involved in it? And could there even be a golden age of philosophy coming? And I remember in 1987, when I connected to the internet for the first time, mm -hmm. you know, plugged my computer into that socket in the wall and realized that my computer had become one of millions of computers that had just become one giant computer. And I just, re I just had a flash, you know, flash realization that, oh dear, the whole world will be one computer, <laughs> which is fantastic and horrible at the same time. And, and my entire philosophical endeavor started right there because the realization that one computer, one world, one computer was going to happen was so strong that I also realized that if we're not aware of that, which is philosophical work, if we don't become aware of that and split that computer into many different, you know, different computers at the same time, we have a major problem. So it took me another 10 years after that, um, folding, having great success in the music industry, uh, selling a record company in 1998 and getting fuck off money, you know, like some of these, our friends, big, big code speculators have become recently these like, you dream about the day when you can check your wallet, you realize, okay, I've got enough money to say no to anything I don't like the rest of my life. By 1998, I had fuck off money. And I ironically joined the Stockholm School of Economics, where I'd studied before, got really interested in all these things, like, for example, value, communication, currencies, you know, economics, and finance. And I had the money, and I started my philosophical career. And two years later, the first book came out. And the first book, The Netocrats, was like this international success, traveled around the world with my co-writer, and realized that could be really successful, the right sort of lighthearted pop books, the kind of books you sell in airports, and, and probably be successful like I'd been with the music before. But I realized, no, I'm going to go really uncompromised. I'm going to be a proper philosopher, like you don't care if anybody gets what you're doing, but I really want to go into what the internet is. And I became obsessed with the relationship between man and technology. I realized that the man-technology relationship is been completely ignored by philosophers. It's like philosophers like existentialists, ontologists, or whatever they were out there, phenomenologists, but none, hardly anybody, was really interested in the man-technology relationship. So I took the dialectical method, that's how you do philosophy. I read guys like Marshall McLuhan, who weren't considered philosophers at the time, they should be considered philosophers by now, who'd written about the man-technology relationship. I studied anthropology, and then I started writing the books and went on with my career. And I haven't looked back since. The last 25 years, I've had a fantastic journey. I have a team now. We travel around the world with digital nomads. Uh, you know, I'm going to a lot of the communities you're involved with. That's how we got connected. Uh, just to study what kind of people are at the forefront of the current revolution. And I'm totally with the people of decentralization. I'm, I'm, I'm a missionary for, missionary for the for the decentralization moment, as I think centralization is what really scares all of us. 
Fantastic. I already have so many questions about that because I'm also a passionate philosopher. I uh, could also say that's also kind of my secret plan to get a few money and then become a philosopher. Mm -hmm. Although I enjoy that now part of what I do and having conversations with people like you on my podcast is already fulfilling that itch of it. I'm in fact thinking about writing a book. Yeah, and, and a quality you share with me that I love is that if you are a philosopher, you must also be an activist. You must be an active agent in the world where you philosophize. A, exactly. You can't just sit in an academic chair somewhere and be an armchair philosopher. That's not philosophy. And that I think was active that I don't personal believe. engagement in the exactly. world is required for you to be a philosopher. So to get the practical real life experience, because otherwise you're just sitting in your ivory tower, right? So that's a realization I had very early on, which made me kind of, no, I don't want to be like that. I first want to get all the experience, soak it all up, and then sort of gravitate towards like reflecting on it and sort of having experience. So is there something, do you realize that there's a difference between you and other philosophers in that way? I would say that the artist as philosopher was done exquisitely by Immanuel Kant. <laughs> Immanuel Kant lived in Königsberg, which is contemporary Kaliningrad, a place that you and I want to declare independent and create a Russian-speaking republic. You know, we have these fancy ideas that actually are not very unrealistic. But say Kaliningrad could be called Kantian or something like that. In the future, we could have the small city-state of the Baltic Sea, which we would love to have. But uh, Königsberg was where Immanuel Kant lived in the, at the end of the 18th century, and he perfected the armchair philosopher project. He was just sitting there as a subject, observing an object, and apparently he never left his hometown his entire life. Now, if you want to have an autist who's not engaged in the world, who's just sitting contemplating on what it means to exist, then Immanuel Kant did that. <laughs> Only a couple of decades later, a guy called Hegel came basically, came by and slaughtered Kant, but it was important that somebody had done the sort of, I'm an autist, I'm sitting and observing the world. This is how far you can take that idea. Right? So Kant finished autistic philosophy. What came with Hegel two decades later, for good or bad, he was a crappy philosopher with a fantastic methodologist, which is why I'm proud to call myself Hegelian in the sense the Hegelian method is the way you do philosophy after Hegel. Hegel realized that we are engaged with the world at all times, including the philosopher himself. You know, all these ideas about like in, in quantum physics that you cannot, you cannot observe something you're engaged with in quantum physics without actually being an active agent in the whole process. It would have an effect on the process itself. Now, that's not strange for Hegelian at all. That actually makes perfect sense. And I say between you and me, for example, there's two men here having a conversation. That means that we're probably looking for a project to unify the two of us, something we're on fire about. Like, yeah, this would be a great thing to do. These are great things. And that would create a sense of brotherhood between us. And that would create our subjectivity. So we're not like subjects sitting there emptily observing an object outside of ourselves, but rather the project is first in Hegel. And out of the project, both the subject and object are byproducts of the product itself. And then what it means to be human. To be human is to get engaged in projects that give you purpose, that give you meaning, that motivate you. And that's, that's, that's my lesson learned from Hegel after Kant is that I want to be an engaged philosopher and activist in the world, just like you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a case to be made that kind of both can work, right? So there is very good philosophers who are just sitting down and thinking, and there's very bad ones who just sit down and think, and then there's very good ones. Who I, have to I just don't think anybody after Kant has, either. yeah, I think Kant finished that. I think, I think he, he is great at being an armchair philosopher. <laughs> Read Immanuel Kant. I mean, it's basics. If you want to do philosophy, you have to read Kant and understand what he was all about. You have to yeah. read Hegel afterwards, see why Hegel was the reaction. To Kant. Yeah. But the, these great Germans at the early beginning of the 19th century inspired me. Um, and then the, the, the 19th century was a golden age for German philosophy. And the 20th century was a golden age for French philosophy. For some reason, the, the Germans and the French are, of course, I'm European myself. This, this is the foundation for my work. Although before... I started doing philosophy myself, I was too embarrassed to start with the Greeks, like the French and the German philosophers in the past had done. And therefore, I also decided to study Eastern philosophy for a couple of decades before I started writing myself. And that, I, I don't regret that at all. It, it was through studying Eastern philosophy that I, for example, discovered that history is basically the history of trade routes. And history is the history of religions that try to avoid people killing strangers constantly, <laughs> mass murdering each other. And, and all of that came out of Persian and Indian and Chinese thinking, which is even older than European thinking. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm devoted to this. I merge these two worlds in my work. A, a guy already in the 1990s at a conference in Canada, like in 1998, he was quite autistic, but very, very smart. This guy walked up to me and said, Bard, your product is East meets West meets digital. And it's a curse. <laughs> and it's what I've been doing ever since. East meets West meets digital. That's what I'm doing. East meets West meets digital. Uh, I'm curious, um, related to the question I asked before, what do you, what insights did you take over or translate into your philosophy from your experience in the music industry? And I'm especially curious because I heard you or read you say something that you left the music industry after you realized that it's about lawyers from record companies chasing teenagers. Yes, this was, I sold my record company in 1998. Hello, Napster. <laughs> I know how to get out of something when, you know, when the golden age is over. Everybody was telling me 1998. It was a very stupid idea to sell a record company with my partner. Um, but I'd seen Napster coming and I knew this was a problem. And uh, I'm a firm believer that history consists of paradigm shifts. And I like to be on the winning side. I don't want to be pathetic. I mean, if I would have been in Paris in 1789, I would definitely have preferred to be in the streets of Paris with the capacity to read and write and count and reading a tabloid in the morning and reading an encyclopedia in the evening and be smart rather than being a silly little literate nobility out of Versailles, right? It's the same thing today. I don't want to be on the losing side of history. And it's quite obvious that the old institutions are all on the losing side of history because eventually the internet and AI and everything else coming is going to slaughter them. They're all at crisis. We have a political crisis. We have a crisis of government. We have a crisis of academia of immense proportions. Get out if you can. Uh, we have a crisis of mass media. It's more or less dead because social media killed it. And that would just go even, even further in the 2020s. And um, so all the old institutions, even I would even say the old economy is definitely dead as well. What we call the industrial economy is dead and over. There are no more just left with the industrial economy. It's not even a race about capital or about money any longer. Uh, the fact that we can do tran transfer value through Bitcoin, for example, is fantastic. But Bitcoin has much more value than that. It's a damn blockchain. And the algorithms and the blockchains and AI tied to that, all these new internet tools that we're getting means that whole new elite will rise out of this. What we called netocrats 23 years ago, like a net aristocracy would rise out of this. And uh, the vast majority of people will be left behind what we call the consumptariat, which is exactly what has happened over the last 25 years. But to be on the winning side of history or to try to basically lay out, this is what's going to happen, you know? And this is dramatic change. This is a paradigm shift. That was a great insight for me. So I personally experienced that in the music industry. What happened was about five years later, around 2003, I was a music manager. I still had a foot in the music industry. But I probably was the most unpopular guy in the entire European music industry because I was both a member of a new political party called the Pirate Party, and I was running a record company at the same time. Sounds a bit schizophrenic, doesn't it, right? Lesson of my life. This was the lesson of, I learned that I could not care less what people think of me because I happened to be the right guy. I was in both, both, in both worlds at the same time. So I could see both worlds. And over those last five years, the music industry changed from the coolest, hippest place you could work into a place for the lawyers chasing teenagers. Pathetic, right? Now, my advice from that lesson of my life is that whenever you work in a company where they employ lawyers to chase teenagers, get out. It's over and done with, right? So I, I, I wouldn't say, I, w I was one of many people who was instrumental in creating Spotify, but I certainly believe Spotify was a good solution to the problem at that stage. It's been a good solution ever since because Spotify came up with the idea that we give the consumers a consumer experience that's better than Pirate Bay, which they gladly pay $10 for a month because it's that much better. Actually, they don't have to store music ever again. They can find any music they like the rest of their lives, have access to it and listen to it whenever they want to. At the same time as on the other front, the record companies got paid. They got paid royalties for streaming, meaning the record companies could then hire more artists, more producers, make more music. So the music production was encouraged. Actually, more music than ever was produced. 
And we got more music than ever available to us to listen to. And now we even have algorithms that know our case before we even ourselves do and give us fantastic playlists for all kinds of environments we walk into. And music is becoming intelligent for the first time ever. This entire revolution is, is a perfect example of a dialectical process. First, the negation happens, file sharing. Oh, the old business model is dead. Well, of course, the vast majority of guys who are in the music industry try to hang on, employed the lawyers, started chasing teenagers, moralized as if there was some kind of golden rule out there that music producers would forever get paid from CD sales. Where did that come from? The CDs were only 10 years old anyway by the time this happened. So technology changes all the time, and when technology changes, the rules of the game change. So that was a lesson learned. The negation exposed how frail the music industry actually was. The resulted in the abstraction, could there be any value in music that could be monetized? So possibly musicians can get paid. Could we have a model for that? And there was, there's a resulting concretion of that abstraction was that we kept the system running for having rights for music, but we transferred it into a service for people that was completely internet friendly. Basically, we transferred it to a web browser. You could have your smartphone, your laptop, you could listen to music anytime you like, which is way better than any way you could consume music in 1998. So this is a perfect example of a dialectical process. I, would, well, I was right in the middle of it. I saw the political aspect of it. I saw the philosophical aspect of it. And of course, some 10, 15 years later, I was repaid by people pointing out that Bard was actually sitting right in the middle of these two fields, not being very popular in 2003, but it was the right place to be for him. So 10 years later, he could come back and give people that experience and said, this is what I saw. And this is actually how digitalization will happen in every damn industry we know of. Yeah. Um, is, is that synthesis that resulted from it that a Spotify, Spotify is miraculous. I love Spotify. But isn't it in a way also a compromise to the old system? Like we accept your copyright. We accept kind of the, um, you know, bribes you pay to the companies that have sort of the lawyers that wants to sort of... Um, that seek rents out of that, that, that setup. It, it is too, it's true. But you have to remember that Spotify alone is worth more than all the world's music companies combined today. So I don't mind. It's, it's a bit like, it's a bit like saying, isn't that like giving in to the farmers in the countryside that we built factories in the cities? Well, listen, it's less than 5% of the economy. Let the fucking farmers build their fucking bacon factories in the countryside. The farmers can build bacon factories and do the pigs, the pig shit while you can do more noble things in your factory in the city. So it's a bit like the old paradigm is still there. And I think it's an important lesson concerning our conversation today is that I firmly believe we're leaving capitalism behind. I firmly believe in moving into something we call detentionalism for the past 25 years. We see this very, very clearly now we start studying what kind of metaphysics we could get out of the AI. What kind of metaphysics will the AI itself have, right? So when we start looking at that, we're definitely moving into a world of sensors and senses. And whose sensors and whose senses is the next question? Who controls these things? And that's the big struggle we have ahead of us, the struggle over control of the senses and the sensors, which is sensocracy. So potentialism with informationalism, with the processing and collection of data, not capital, takes over. Capitalism will still be there. But it, it, it's easy to bl get blinded because we've learned that capitalism is the ultimate system, which is, again, not a law at all. It's an historical contingency, nothing else. So therefore, when I hear the term the attention economy, my first question is always, what do you mean my attention is an economy? My eyes and my ears are not for sale. Rather the opposite. If anybody throws a fucking ad in front of me that I hate, I, I just push spam on the button, get rid of it, never to be seen again. And if it ever pops up again, I'm probably in the wrong place and I'm leaving, right? So if I'm not accessible, if I don't give my attention any longer to somebody pay their way to try to turn me to some kind of an eye and ear whore, because I don't want to be a whore. I don't want my eyes and my ears to whore, right? I don't want to be prostituted in my senses. I want to be in control of my senses. I want to give attention to what I find important in my life. And that's my number one value in my life. I want to teach that value to my kids. I want to teach that value to my family, my friends. 
Now, that's attentionalism. That means the war over attention is not a war over money because attention can fundamentally not be bought. This is so weird for most people, uh, certainly for capitalists. <laughs> but Bitcoin in this way is fantastic in the sense that it sums up, summarizes capitalism and perfects it. You cannot improve on capitalism once Bitcoin is there. That's the fantastic thing with cryptocurrencies. So you will now also have the perfect contracts. You will have all these things that come out of blockchain. Algorithms improve constantly, and we will soon start to demand that the algorithms are free and open. So the algorithm reflects me and my choices in my life. I don't care if I give away my data, but I certainly care if the algorithms are personal and personally just to me. I don't want anybody else out there to manipulate my algorithm, which politics tries to do today. I don't want anybody else there to corrupt my algorithm, which what advertisers try to do. And I don't want anybody there to conform my algorithm to suit with everybody else, which is what academia is trying to do. So I want all those old institutions to die, to be free and open, live in a free and open world where I have a free and open algorithm. And I'd even pay for it, no problem at all. I'd, I'd, I'd do anything to have an algorithm that is uncompromised, reflecting me. And maybe with some randomness thrown in for good measure, so I don't just repeat myself. But that's essentially what you want. Now, if you look at what algorithms are going to be eventually for all the people that, are, you know, you want to reach the early adopters, really the guys that go before everybody else that advertisers always try to reach and can never, ever reach again. Now, if, if you see the algorithms that way, and AI that way, and blockchains that way, you see this is the real internet. It's just beginning right now. Yeah, I definitely want to get to that point in our conversation to discuss that thesis more that Bitcoin will sort of um, lead to this purer, better form of money that through the internet kind of replaces capitalism. And what I want to get at is kind of the contradictions or the tensions with the thesis that would lead to a more pure and more free form of capitalism, something that probably someone like Eric Warhees would say, someone that I had on my podcast, something that I also sympathized with in a way. But before we get there, Can you talk a bit more about your thesis or your book of the book, The Netocrats, and how it evolved over time? And I'm sort of stating my prior belief or what I read ab about it or from it, um, and you can edit it and correct it. It was sort of as you were saying, and that was very prescient in um, writing it in 2000, I think, right? Yes, Maybe, think, 23 years 2000, ago. Yeah, sort of who controls the information and the internet, that will be sort of where the value is created, right? So, and that was like before Google or Facebook became big, right? So can you talk a bit about the thesis of the book and how it evolved over time? Okay, so any elite has three different elements to it. So any paradigm in history has a real power and the real power is the power over the assets. Whoever controls and can do whatever they like with the assets of a given society is the real power. But there's also symbolic power because human beings use language and words. And symbolic power is the power that produces the official truth. And this is the official truth about the new order, the new paradigm and the order of things and how this paradigm is God's gift, God's gift to mankind for the new historical period ahead of you. Um, so any metaphysical idea that's perfect for that power structure will be the dominant idea of that paradigm. It's very Nietzsche, as you can tell. The third one is imaginary power. This is what you usually mean when you just say, who's got the power? You say, well, the king's got the power or, or Donald Trump's got the power or whatever. Like, you think of politicians and kings and things like that. Of course, they're less powerful than the other two, but the imaginary power is there and it's important because the imaginary power connects the other two. The point with the power triad is that it's very stable over time. So none of the three aspects of the power can control an entire paradigm. So if the real power goes off and tries to control it too much, the imaginary symbolic powers will unite against the real power. And they will then dictate and have storytelling and all other kinds of weapons to take that real power and minimize its influence. So it's very stable over time. That's the point with the triad. Um, so go back to the previous paradigm. Before the printing press arrived in Germany in 1415, changed the world forever. Before that, we had a feudal society or a feudalist society. They, the kind of society Putin wants to drag us back into. He's a total loser just because of that. You don't have to moralize against Putin to declare him an idiot. You can just say that, no, we don't want to go back for our years on history, idiot. We want to go forward, and Russians deserve that. So, um, but a feudalist society 
you had the nobility who owned land, because land ownership was the ultimate horizon of power and influence, it was real power. There was no money involved in any meaningful way, and land ownership could not be traded for money. It was given to the nobility, they kept it, and they had the power of land because agricultural production dominated the economy. So um, besides the nobility, you had the church, and the church declared the official truth. It preached a feudalist religion. Of all the different religious alternatives that came out of antiquity, it was Christianity and Islam that won because Christianity and Islam said, you should go to work six days a week and work really hard. On the seventh day, you go to the mosque or the church and there you promise life eternally after you're dead because um, it doesn't cost us anything to promise you that and nobody can check. So perfect religions or feudalism. Um, Christianity and Islam are therefore two paradigms ago. Please note that, right? So, uh, and the church was the symbolic power. And the imaginary power was royalty, I mean, monarchy, kings and queens and stuff like that with their courts. That system stayed until Paris 1789 with the full effect of the printing press blew it away because you now had cities instead of rural countryside. And in the cities, you had money, you had capitalism, you had a bourgeoisie that had the capital, but basically people owned stock in industry, for example, and become wealthy capitalists live in urban centers and they build factories called cities and these cities take over the world. We get the nation state as a result of that. Napoleon understood this first. Coming out of the French Revolution, he just showed that. Why do we create an army when all the soldiers can read and write? Even the cannon fodder can read and write my army and his army beat the shit out of everybody else. He was, he was definitely the new paradigm personified. Um, so out of the Napoleonic power structure, we got capitalism. We have the bourgeoisie who own everything. Again, real power is money and owning industry, real power. Symbolic power here. Well, who bit the shit out of the church? The universities. Academia came along. So out of the university and monasteries came instead the universities and said, no, 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 we don't believe in God any longer. We're enlightened human beings now. Uh, instead, we are, you know, we are minds within bodies. We can make up our own minds. Individualism came along. Liberalism came along. All the different political ideologies in response to liberalism being a bit too much for the elites. We got socialism that sort of tried to apply to the underclass, etc. So all the different isms, political ideologies we got after Paris 1789 came out of this revolution. So we had uh, imaginary power called politics, we had real power called capitalism or money, and we had a new symbolic power, which was academia. Academia also then was added to that was mass media in the 20th century because mass media was basically academia given to the masses. So it was affordable. So through reading a newspaper every day, you became a smart person, right? So that whole system had been intact until a funny little thing called the internet comes along. And what the internet does, if you take the Napoleonic power structure, you look at the candle fodder at the bottom, what the internet does, it enables the candle fodder to start talking directly to each other. That's exactly what has happened over the last 30 years. And the cannon fodder, without knowing anything, they just talk to each other and gossip and get to know each other and create social media. They spend an hour a day, two, three, four, five, six, seven hours a day <laughs> being socially savvy. Uh, that means Napoleon is dead. That means the old institutions are over, all three of them. And how's that? Because they cannot have access to you any longer. You basically say, I don't want everything to do with you because everything is happening now in an online world. And the online world dictates my offline world. So my virtual world is beginning to dictate and control my physical world. And I don't mind because I like to make informed decisions about everything in my life. I don't want to be a stupid idiot like I used to be 30 years ago. I go online. I find out what kind of people should I hang out with? What kind of restaurant should I go to? Where should I travel? Who should I marry? You know, everything that's important to me, decision made online. Now, if those decisions are made online and the old powers can't reach any longer, that means they're done. So this is going to happen in different episodes. The, the new netocracy in its different, three different aspects. We laid it out in the netocrats 23 years ago. But first, there has to be a new asset that beats cash, and that's data. Bitcoin, of course, being both, had as covered. Data, data beats cash, meaning whoever's got the data, Capital is going to go to the data rather the other way around. Whoever can, has the largest amount of data that he can process, for example, the data, like open AI, the money will go that way. Money goes to wherever data is collected. That means data is more important than money. The way 
when you had money and could go to the countryside of France or Germany and buy a castle and kick out the nobility out of the castle and have a laugh at them because you had more money than they did. So you now own the castle. The same thing here. If data beats capital, whoever's got the data will beat the capital. We wrote about this 23 years ago. Since then, big tech happened. I don't think anybody doubts any longer that if nine out of the 10 biggest companies in the world are big tech companies, big tech has taken over the world. Actually, it's taken over the world to such an extent that nothing happens in Washington, D.C. any longer. Washington, D.C. as a charade is political theater. And in The Netocrats, we wrote that in the very near future, Americans will regard politics as being so ironic and so ridiculous that they will pick a reality TV show star for president which they did 60 years later. His name is Donald Trump. Basically, Donald Trump is not even president of the United States. He's a TV show. And the TV show moves into the White House with a wicked witch called Nancy Pelosi or something. And then he moves out of the White House four years later to move back in again four years later, which is hold iron. The United States Congress has not made a single legal decision since 2018 that affects technology in any way. Not a single decision in the last five years. My friends in big tech in California now go to Europe to see the European Union to at least have some kind of resistance and somebody who sets up the rules of the game so they know the rules of the game they're going to play because they control and own the world. Big tech, first of the three autocracies, written in a prophecy 23 years ago, it's going to be the first one. That's the, what we call the informationalists. Now, the problem, though, is that we have the symbolic and the imaginary left. So if politics dies, what replaces it? Well, the Chinese have their version of that. The Chinese have come up with the idea that we're going to create a Confucian censocracy. We put censors on everybody and everywhere and check people's senses. So have a censocracy with a little guy at the top. And we're going to go for dictatorship. We're going to go big on dictatorship. We believe that's the model because we're Confucians. A bit like if we let the Platonists run the West. Because Platonism and Confucianism are very similar. Okay, so the Chinese have presented an alternative. Now you understand why me and John Sedeck have been working in Taiwan for the past few years. We work with anybody. We work in India. We work in any country right now that is opposed to the idea that Chinese come up with the ultimate model for a sociocracy. So we're working towards a pluralist sociocracy. What would it mean to control the world through censors and census, which is unavoidable, it's going to happen. Why not? Because then we finally have an intelligent world instead of a stupid one, which I think we could all benefit from. I mean, the values that come out of mass intelligence are fantastic. And I think it's unavoidable. But the question is, how do we create a pluralist and sovereignty? This is our dominant question in our work. I mean, John Sedeck is. How do we create that pluralist and sovereignty while we still have time? That's what we're concerned with. Not concerned with AI. We're concerned with sensocracy. Because AI is just part of how you control people. Like, we're concerned with how some people in elite control other people. And that is why we are against dictatorship and tyranny. And we actually describe dictatorship as problematic because dictatorship tends to be very idiotic. It took seven months for Xi Jinping in China to find out that a virus has leaked out of a laboratory in Wuhan. And the cost for that was 30 million people dead. Not a good idea, dictatorship, because nobody dares to tell Stalin the bad news. This is why we're opposed to dictatorship. We're not more or less against it. We say it's a stupid system. It looks great because who doesn't want to be the king of the world at the top of a big hierarchy? But it's actually idiotic. And we trace that all the way back to antiquity. When the Egyptians tried dictatorship, it lasted for six years, and then Egypt fell apart and never rose back again. It's called the Bronze Age Collapse. Whereas the Persians installed the system where power was split from the very beginning. It was invented by Zoroaster Bishnaspa, priest and a king in Persia about 1700 before Christ. Most civilized idea ever. Eventually, when Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon in 539 before Christ, which I think is one of the most important events in world history, he surprised everybody by not boiling his enemies' children in oil, like you usually do when you were conquered before that. Cyrus the Great instead told the Babylonians, you're not good enough at being Babylonian. Become better Babylonians. I'm going to sponsor your fucking temples. You, have a, you, you worship your God properly. Don't matter. Be more Babylonian with me, right? That idea is so fantastic. It's a Zoroastrian idea of how you run an empire. And I'm totally on fire about it, you can tell. 
that was really important with the Sorasses was they came up with the idea we should split power into a power triad from the very beginning. This idea was then through the Freemasonry and everything in the French, inherited by the Americans, is today called the United States Constitution. It's a fantastic paper, right? It would create an ultimate system of capitalism, which is the United States of America. And it's still important. It will still save the United States for another round in history. Because if you split power before you press the button and power is being installed, you won't have tyranny. You will have a much more intelligent system where the different systems battle each other. So we have a sensocracy, symbolic power. We have a real power, which is data, big data, big tech, informationalism. The third one, no, I would say that's the imaginary power and, and the real power. Excuse me for that. Imaginary power is sensocracy. Real power is data. The last one, the symbolic powers we call protopians. We simply have arrived at the point in history with just the incremental optimization or process of what we're really fascinated with. This is where the Japanese and the Chinese and the Indians agree with anybody from the West. We don't believe in utopias any longer. We don't believe in dystopias either. We just believe that if we got a problem, we can solve it. It would solve it through better technologies. That's called protopianism. And I think protopianism is basically where art and education, all those things are located for the next, say, 100 years. And that's where I'm going, personally, with my investments and my interest and what I work with is that I go into that realm of protopianism. And for example, I love the idea of killing all the world's universities and, and high schools and giving everybody a fucking great AI that can teach them anything they like during their whole lifetime. You know, that, that's, that's what I'm on fire about. Protopianism. Protopian. So socracy, protopianism, and informationalism are three very useful words. Together, mm. though, what replaces capitalism, which is separate from this, they're all part of the same thing, is attentionalism. And attentionalism is the game between human beings in interhuman relationships is that what do we give our attention to? And I think we all want to decide that for ourselves. I don't know a single human being who doesn't want to decide for themselves what to give attention to. But I think that's the ultimate game. And it well, also it means that we have, to restore, we have to restore the private and the sacred you know, to, to find that. Mm -hmm. I mean, with and people don't like to have to decide, right? They want someone else to make decisions for them, kind of to reduce the variance of sort of the quality of their decisions, right? They're just comfortable sometimes, you know, I just pay someone to just give me something like a TV program or something that's like digestive towards them, right? To, to not have well, to actually, think too much yeah, about what... True, true. Yeah, but, but you don't have to think that much any longer. The thing is that your playlist on Spotify, remember that the playlist was the really great thing with Spotify, and we kind of have playlists around ourselves everywhere now, and they're intelligent, and they give us not what we want. They give us exactly the mix of challenge and what we want in the sense that we like it, right? So we go, yeah, wow, that was a surprising new track. Who did that come from? Who came up with that? And that curiosity is evidence that our attention is there. So what we're studying on the laboratory is nothing but phenomenology. And I think phenomenology is about to leave philosophy, which I don't mind, and become a real science to start what people actually react to. For example, the people are obsessed with ambivalence. They, it's, it's not the obvious thing we spend our energy on. We spend the things like, what, what the fuck's that? You know, that's weird. Or I say people go to amusement parks and pay to get shocked. And, you know, sex. <laughs> hey, we love sex, right? Freud is fantastic. One of the greatest thinkers ever. Go into sexuality. And it's like, I don't know if I want this or don't want this. That's when you really want it, right? So dominance, submission is really fascinating. I'm personally meta heterosexual. And like, I love the idea of man and woman interplay, but in different variations and things. Masculine and feminine, exhibitionism, voyeurism, all these things. I love them. I love pornography. Pornography is fantastic if you're an anthropologist. Because people are really sincere and they expose themselves and they expose their own souls and they tell you what they really, really want. So all these areas are great to explore right now. Phenomenology is finally becoming a proper science and I find it incredibly fantastic. But you're right. The vast majority of people have a slave mentality. They like a master and they like to follow the master. And that's also partly because for us human beings, we're actually collectively intelligent in the sense that we are not so much intelligent beings as we're mimetic beings. Somebody does something that looks like an okay thing to do, we do the same thing. I mean, your entire childhood is nothing but mimetic behavior. It's just like, what do, they, what, what do my parents do? What do the grown-ups do? Oh, they do this way. That's cool. I want to do like they do. And that's great. You know, it, 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 
I mean, you have a German background, Germanic background like myself, I'm Northern Europe. We love the idea of having a master and, and a student, and the student learns from the master, and the master shows you exactly how to do this. And then when you can really, really do what the master does, you have the mastery of the art, then you can start to innovate as well on top of that. But I think I'm okay with the fact that the vast majority of people follow somebody, they follow a taste, they do like others do, the mimetic things. That's just humane. People do that. But what's interesting here is, of course, who are the early adopters? Who are the guys who just can't stand mimicking others, who just want to do their own thing, who want yeah. to do the novel thing? And they always lead at paradigm shifts. Yeah, and I wonder if a lot of sort of cultural human evolution comes down to how we treat the outliers, right? Because in some places they're like regulated or arrested or put in jail or put in prison because people aren't comfortable with all the new things that they're dabbling with, right? So you now when, when the internet came about, oh, what about the porn, the scam or with crypto, with Bitcoin? Oh, what about like the black markets and everything like that? And now with like gene therapy, biotechnology, oh, what about the mad scientists? So it's there's something to or me. AI for that matter. AI is going to kill us. Apparently it's like, how? Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, exactly. So the, the problem is this outcasts are incredibly needed. We call them shamanoid personalities. There's about 4% of the entire human population, any human population, about 4% of shamanoid characteristics. It actually happens to be identical to the number of androgynous characteristics. So LGBT people and shamanoid people are about 4% each. And then 92% of the population, any population, New Guinea, China, Germany, Greenland, doesn't matter. 92% of any population are regular Joes and Jills, and they just perfectly happen to just mimic their neighbors. That's okay. But the problem with the regular Joes and Jills is they don't understand the value of the shamanoids. So they go after the shamanoids. They call lynch mobbing. And a lot of the big tech guys are very aware of this because a fantastic French professor at Stanford called René Girard, who was the master to Peter Thiel, for example, and Peter Thiel was a student at Stanford. Girard taught Peter Thiel everything. And Girard was a fantastic thinker of lynch mobbing and why the problem is with lynch mobbing. And what was great that Girard was there is that that happened right before the internet came along and the paradigm shift started happening. Because here's the switch. When the paradigm shift happens, all of a sudden, the shamanoid characters that everybody thinks are the lunatics, the margins of society, become the leaders because they are the ones who just happen to be in the new place and understand the new times, and therefore they become the new elite. Therefore, in our new book coming out in August, Process Event for me and we wrote an exodology. So if you look at the Exodus in the Bible, there was clearly a small minority of people in Egypt who were outcasts. They were some kind of slaves, although they were smart. They were treated like shit. And they just came to a point where they said, listen, why are we even staying here? Why don't we go somewhere else? And they conducted an exodus. And basically, this guy Moses and his brother Aaron and their sister Miriam, three again, power tried. They walked around and asked everybody, who wants to join us and go somewhere else? It's not going to be the Nile. It's not going to be as comfortable as this. There's going to be less people that we can do what we want. We're going to leave. We're going to get out. Hey, exactly what you and I are interested in today. New city states, tried new, you know, what, what if we just leave and start fresh somewhere? So they did. They walked out, started fresh 40 years later, built the promised land and introduced monotheism to the world. And nothing has been the same ever since. They actually even introduced a new alphabet to the world about 800 before Christ, the revolution as the way we write and think. So the Hebrews and the Phoenicians came out of Egypt and they came out of Egypt precisely because they were just fed up. They said, we're leaving. So the question is, who does an exodus anywhere in the world today? Those are the people I'm interested in. That's how you and I got connected. Because I love these people who said, well, I'm not going to stay here. I'll go somewhere else. And there we'll pursue exactly what I think is the right thing. And these are the people who say, you know, technology is being adapted too, too slowly. And the old institutions are trying to control it. I'm at, I want an environment where new technologies are embraced. We can start to build a laboratory, see what happens. We, we're willing to take risks. We want to move history forward, we want to accelerate history, and we don't want any of the old institutions to have any influence over us all, at all, right? And these are now the wealthiest places on the planet. Even in rudimentary foreign places like Dubai and Singapore are now the wealthiest places on the planet, which proves the theory. The paradigm shift is here. The exodology is where we should look. So the question is, where can we go to then do what we want to pursue? 
And this, yeah, this yeah. is where the shamanoids take over. The shamanoids of the, the outcasts of the old paradigm become the elite of the new paradigm. Fantastic. Yeah, um, that's exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's sort of the idea of the frontier and sort of always sort of expanding it because if you don't, then, you know, the status quo and the normies will take over and just choke all innovation. So you have to always go where the frontier is. And I wonder what your, where your thoughts are at, to what degree, if at all, is the internet still a frontier or where is it if it is? And second, sort of what is sort of the, do you see as the new frontiers? Because you've been saying you've been looking for these new places where the outcasts go. What are you finding so far? Where are you looking at mostly right now for like places in the physical world? Yeah, so we decided to decide when the internet age started because nobody formulated that. And we decided it was the opening of a film called Kaineskatsi in Los Angeles in 1982. And we, we honored California. California being hippies, freedom, loving, very, you know, the ultimate American dream of with a laptop on the beach, you know, basically. And, and that's exactly why tech happened in California. Now that's over. That's all we're done with. And everybody's asking, so where is it moving next? And I think what actually happened over the last few years is that we realized that it has literally moved online. You can now be anywhere you want in the world and sit and collaborate with anybody else. And um, we didn't invent the term digital nomads, but we invented the term global nomads. That was me and John Sudeikis in the 1990s. So the, the digital nomads are what I'm following today, studying intensely. My team are all digital nomads. They travel anywhere they like in the world and get to know people. And, you know, these swarms, people, not mobs. Mobs are negative things. Swarms are a positive thing. Something that the Pirate Party founder, Rick Falkling, and I agreed once that we're going to use swarms in a positive sense and mobs in a negative one. But these swarms of people are moving around. If they don't get what they want in one place, if they don't get the best Wi-Fi, the lower cost, good quality food, yoga studios, and, you know, connect their laptops and sit and work, they just go somewhere else, which is great. We already have a perfect economy and perfect competition when it comes to digital nomadism. I think we've already gone online in that sense. I think space does not exist to us any longer uh, because it's all real time. The, the, the only time ever, and it's fascinating to study in the phenomenological laboratories, when you've got somebody from Iceland trying to play a computer game with somebody in New Zealand, and New Zealand and are so far away from each other that actually for the time it takes for, for a signal to go up to the satellite, from the satellite to another satellite at the part of the planet, and then down to that computer, there's a slight, 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 slight microsecond delay. can be sensed. But in reality, it turns out that the speed of light is so perfectly geared towards our planet coming to a certain point in history when space basically disappears, that we can count space out. It takes less than 24 hours to transport your body to the side of the globe anyway, if you want to, but... In reality, you could be anywhere you like. I move around myself. I use Scandinavia some bases in the summers, winters, I'm gone somewhere else. I've been living like that for the last 35 years. And it, it's so much richer to live that way. And this is already happening. Uh, are you in, are you in Roatan, Honduras right now? Yeah. Yeah, because you need to tell people about why you're there because there are people also are followers who follow me who want to go into this conversation. So why don't you take over, Nicholas, and tell people why you are in Roatan, Honduras, because I'm coming there this fall as well. So yeah, yeah, please. I mean, it is the frontier, right? I always say when people come here, here's the promised land, <laughs> right? I mean, the background is sort of the idea of new cities and the network state by Balaji Srinivasan. I think these are two complementary ideas, charter cities and network states. Sort of one, the network state is kind of a more online world, but to spawn changes in the real world. Right. It was meaning to say that all the online stuff is very good. It helps us coordinate. It helps us find each other. It helps us to you know, start communities. But then I think the real world is catching up with us. Like when it comes to digital nomadism, airports are getting worse and worse and just longer and longer waiting times, higher frictions. Airline speeds have not increased since the 1970s. Right. So there's all this stuff we need to get right in the physical world as well. And this is where cities or places or physical territory comes in because it's the shell for off to bring sort of offline uh, online innovation offline right when it comes to biotechnology when it comes to robotics drones energy it's just very important to keep things running and that's i think where we need physical shells and this is why i'm here in prosper because it's a jurisdiction that gets i think the virtual digital layer 
right in terms of its system of laws and governance, right, which is sort of a polycentric law system, which I think is optimal to sort of have better regula regulatory options for businesses that build in the physical world, to some degree also in the digital world, sort of digital assets, things like that. So I think it's the most forward thinking um, jurisdiction in the world right now. And I think it's the kind of model, the zero to one to emulate for others. And we're already seeing, like I did a conference in Montenegro this year, bringing sort of the new cities and network state people together. And that's kind of showing what's possible. So now we're getting a tons of new projects in Africa, in like Tanzania, in Nigeria, in Zambia, and hopefully many more projects in Latin America. So I think now we're at a point where we have some experience, you know, negotiating with governments, getting partnerships to build sort of new jurisdictions where we can combine online governance with sort of an influence and really spawn sort of a new technological, the wave of technological progress in the real world, which is why I'm here. Fantastic. And please note here for all of you who are following the conversation, decentralization is at the core here, which is why we love it as philosophers. The different types of experiments on different levels. So you could say, for example, that large empires like America and China and Russia are going to have enormous problems because the world itself is the empire now. Uh, we wrote a book called The Global Empire in 2003. We said that if you put a network over a planet and that network has no boundaries, you get a global empire. And that's the name of the book. It's not a political empire. It's not a human empire. It's a technological empire. That's already the case. Technology can now catch the data from anywhere in the world and that data can travel anywhere in the world in no time, you know, at speed of light. And therefore, it's abundantly available everywhere. The global empire, therefore, in fact, therefore, we don't need human or political empires. And here's the funny, if we don't need any traditional human political empires, then small city states are the perfect model. What you want is you want an airport so you connect with the world physically as well. You want great Wi-Fi so you connect virtually, digitally with the rest of the world. Um, you want those two things with maybe a city with some fun shit in it, like nightclubs and restaurants and things. You have a quality of life. You get the best of ever world. You want a small countryside around it, which is rural, where you can grow a few plants and have a few greenhouses and shit like that. You like that. And maybe a little nice river floating to it. Now, there are small countries like Estonia and Montenegro that we love because you can go to these places and you have young governments. They're willing to take risks on a level you never see in large countries like Germany and Britain or America, or whatever. So you can start doing these things. And for example, it's an interesting question is Puerto Rico, for, because Puerto Rico will legally have to decide sooner or later whether it's going to be the 51st state of the United States or whether it might, instead of Brexit, be the first country to say, no, we're not going to be part of the United States of America. We're going to go independent. And I think it's exactly because so many tech people are moving to Puerto Rico, trying to push Puerto Rico to dare to become like a Caribbean paradise that actually goes its own way, that it's a really interesting place to see what happens. Of course, the Watan is another experiment. Prospera have basically gone and said to the government of Honduras, just take this island here in the West Indies and allow us to buy a little property there and see if we can build a smaller Hong Kong, which is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> because if it works, this is the thing with human beings, the mimetic, if it works, others can copy it. I love the idea of best practice. I think it's a philosophical concept. If somebody does something among humans and it works, you can't deny that it works, you can do it somewhere else. And this is why we're on fire about to see what happens to Russia. I think it's a good bet that Russia's going to fall apart. It's going to get very bloody and messy, unfortunately. But at the end of the day, on the other side of that, that means you have a lot of potential in the future of Russia to actually create new models like you can in Ukraine. New models, for example, Kiev in Ukraine was the first city in the world where you started buying property using blockchain. It's perfect. It, it precisely places like Ukraine, Honduras, Montenegro. That's where the new shit's going to happen. Africa. Definitely. A lot of this is going to happen in Africa. So these are the places where maybe you could say that the people are more desperate than anywhere else in the world, or they're just younger than anywhere else in the world but because they got Wi-Fi and we got the know-how and everybody's been online their entire lives now anywhere in the world. You might as well go to places where no old infrastructure works and people are young. And that's probably most likely the place where new shit's going to happen. A person yeah, exactly. working in Rwanda, you know, so there you go. So these smaller city states are the future. I, I provocatively say we're moving towards the dark ages again, but dark ages is kind of fun anyway, because we don't need these large, na huge nation states with their clumsy bureaucracies and their centralization and the huge governments that pay each other off. And, you know, 
We don't need any of those. We need the small, tiny city states, low tax rates, um, movability, accessibility, fast turnarounds with ideas. And that's why I'm saying already today, Singapore and Dubai stand out. Huge airports, small city states, low taxes, high end economies, high tech, and pay better salaries anywhere else in the world, wealthier than anywhere else in the world. So I think this is the future. Yeah. I, I think Prospera agree. is a fantastic, fantastic yeah. experiment. Yeah. 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 Something I keep thinking about that I'd love your thoughts on, since you also written kind of a book on that, is sort of the building community and the symbolic power aspect of it, right? Sort of to what degree do you need a theology and symbolism to kind of create a movement or a community? Well, this is the thing with tech. If you go back to California, and we could honor California from the 1980s and 1990s because big tech came out of there. Um, it was just the most, it was a friendly environment for innovation. So what I do in my work with Jan Sedek is, is that I take Nietzsche's concept of world to power. And we split it in two. Because actually two different worlds. One of them is world to intelligence. And that's the willingness of human beings to learn. You've got to have a lot of will to intelligence installed first. Learning institutions like Stanford, Berkeley, et cetera, were absolutely instrumental for the California miracle to happen. Then you had the MIT, you had Caltech, you had others too. But you, know, you had these academic institutions that at the end of academia pushed out all the best engineers to basically kill academia one day, which was big tech is doing. But that's what happened. And the, you had the will to intelligence secure. Then you had the will to transcendence on top of that, which is like this sort of counterculture hippie attitude in Northern California. It's like, you can do anything you like. Take tons of drugs. See what happens, you know? The first time I came to the Burning Man Festival, and I love Burning Man. The first time I came there, I realized that Twitter was invented here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Somebody took drugs and came up with the idea. And they said, yeah, why don't we do it? Let's do it, right? You got to create an environment that is so open and free and experimental that is basically a laboratory of ideas. That's what we call the will to transcendence. And the combo, whenever you find out the will to intelligence and the will to transcendence occur in the same place, that's where innovation is going to explode. And you better not have any old paradigm standing in the way, blocking the innovation. The less of an old paradigm you have, the less of an old infrastructure you have standing in the way, and the more will to intelligence is secured, and the more will to transcendence can dance on top of the will to intelligence, the more innovation you will have. Now, this will, of course, be, cert be certain geographical places. For example, if Prospera flies, nobody's going to benefit more from that than the country of Honduras, which is the beauty of the idea. Like China benefited enormously from Hong Kong until they occupied it. Now that entire benefit's over, done with, anybody with the brain is leaving Hong Kong in droves, right? Because nobody wants to be part of the Chinese system. So the, the, the beauty of this idea is that people who are experimental and innovative, they love freedom. They're shamanoid. So anybody I talked to, they said, you got you to gotta invent a place that is comforting and welcoming to shamanoids because if you create like the perfect wilderness for weird people to do weird shit, you got innovation coming. Because everything else, the world to intelligence is even now becoming the eight. The AI is nothing but a fantastic support system from underneath for people to be innovative on top. And it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. Yeah, yeah. So is there any sort of curation element that you need to kind of create a culture like that? And you, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. This is the word from the Netocrats again 23 years ago. The curators are now more important than the producers. Uh, so... I can use Midjourney and Midjourney can print me five different illustrations to text I just wrote and they're all kind of funny and weird and all that. But I will pick one of them, meaning the artist is now me as the curator picking out of five different alternatives, I pick the one that I prefer. So curatorship is already artistic today. And curatorship is, I think, fundamental to protopianism. It's fundamental to what we look at as creativity today. But since AI can only reproduce history, in different variations that are all lamer and worse than anything you've seen before. I mean, the AI today can create a Beatles song, but it's not a Beatles song because it's worse than any Beatles song ever was. So you might as well listen to the old Beatles songs anyway, because they're better, right? It's, how, it's like, it's like if, if the AI creates a Beatles song, then it sounds like the Beatles are 95 years old in retirement home and they're demented. It's not Beatles at the prime, for sure. So 
because that had innovation. It, it had pathos in it, and there's no pathos ever in AI. A pathos is just a fantastic, massive logos operation. That's what it is. So I'm, I'm just looking for those environments where, where you have that mix that, that encourages innovation to occur, but you have to have advanced know-how. You have to have advanced knowledge at the bottom, an epistem that works. You can't just innovate from out of nothing, as some kids think these days, because it's not going to happen. And actually, when you move into the next phase of technology, wherever it's going, like biotechnology, which you and I both love, like, you know, when you do biotechnology, which really provokes people, because we always thought that we human beings are a constant and we would never change. And suddenly we realize we can actually affect ourselves. We can change ourselves. So since this is already happening and it's getting banned in so many places. I think biotechnology is key because the place in the world that are most welcome to biotechnology will take a huge leap forward and be ahead of everybody else. That's something I'm completely certain. So I, th I think it's interesting to look at the world map these ways these days and see how, okay, so who's dare, who dares to be innovative and who dares to be welcoming to the innovators? And if you're not, you're out of the game. Yeah. You end up at the bottom. Something I keep coming back to, and we're talking briefly about that at the beginning, kind of making concessions to the old order, right? So with Spotify and the cops, right, and the lawyers and the record companies, and that's something that seems to also come back to some of these projects, right? So you have political trade-offs. You need to make concessions to the Honduran government and pay them taxes. And then, you know, the old order, they react sort of allergically to things that are too far out of the Overton window, right? So we're doing gene therapy and that's already attracting a lot of negative attention, even though it's very safe and great. I love the people that are involved there. But then, you know, everything else that you do, like if we were to do sort of more on the nuclear energy side or sort of more sort of biotechnology and experiments and things like that, they would always attract kind of this negative attention and hostility, right? So there's this trade-off you have to make between sort of how free you are versus how much concessions you make to the existing order. There... Or just leave. Get out of Egypt. Because all I do is that I'm basically telling people, listen, it, it, listen if, you want my, if you want my innovative power, or if you want the innovative power from the bunch of people I belong to, the Shamanoids, then if you don't give me what I want, I move. I leave. You're done. You're poor. You're at the bottom. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be successful because if you see the, the boring, I love Europe. I love Europe's history, but the boring thing with Europe today is this immense amount of bureaucracy that prevents innovation. Like you want to do anything, you got to get all these permits, you got to go through all these courts. And then after years, they come back and say, no, there's a little, we discovered there's this little mosquito that lives close to that. And apparently this mosquito can go, you know, wait, there's a lot of it, but we don't even know where it's at. But it's just an excuse to stop you from innovating, right? Yeah. And you know that's all there's to it. Yeah. And this is why I'm talking about exodology. I talk about how do you leap. Then where you go, the promised land, wherever you try to find a promised land, say, for example, Prospera, has to have some kind of structure to it. But the best metaphor for that that I use is a nightclub. So a nightclub has a door guy. You can't just walk in. The door guy will probably tell you, okay, if you pay enough money, we'll let you in. Like if you don't have like a criminal track record that's just absolutely disgustingly awful, uh, you know, like you're, you, you, you seem sane. Um, and, and if you were a criminal in the past, probably because you broke rules, they should have been broken. They would love you, right? You're, you're a rebel. Come on in. Right? The door guy says you're allowed in and you pay a small fee to get in. Now, the thing, though, with anything you do today, if you start from scratch, is that you will publish everything you do. You will operate everything with transparency. There's something governments refuse to do. Because governments are in a game where they force us to pay way more taxes than we think. The average Western European citizen today pays on average twice as much taxes as they think. It's a really dirty game, right? Now, when that's exposed, the first you do if you run a great nightclub is that, okay, you pay a fee at the door to get in. The fee goes to this. And then you publish it. And it's running the nightclub. So you get inside the nightclub, anything else you do in there, you pay a fee for it. I want a drink, you pay a fee for that. Maybe there are five different bars competing. Great, it's a great nightclub because I can go to any bar I like. They have different rates at different drinks, but I go to the bar that I can afford where I can get the drinks that I like the most, which is a market. It's a bazaar, right? So the more bars you got inside the nightclub, the better off you are. Then also, this is the trick why nightclub is a great metaphor. 
The night club will have a VIP lounge. And when you come to the VIP lounge, say, okay, those guys are the coolest guys in the room. And then, you know, the door guy comes up to you and says, but you're not getting in there. And you say, why not? Because you can't pay your way in. Because the VIP lounge today in any city state you come to is the attentionist of Oh, how do I get in there? You have to create an attentional value that's equally distributed to the other members of the community. You're going to be, you know, a successful citizen of the community. You're going to be honored by the community. Like, oh, this guy came here, gave his life, gave his heart to our community. He didn't expect to get paid back. He just gave his heart to the community. Oh, we want to honor this guy. We give him a medal. We put him in the category of the VIP lounge. And then you just allow the guys in the VIP lounge to have the last word over things. That's how, that's how a really good sensocracy works. You let those guys have the last word, but they've been around, they're successful, and they've contributed to the community. And they're honored by the community for the contribution. Okay, so you give them the last same things. Now, since everything else is transparent in the system, if I don't like the nightclub, I leave. <laughs> I, I've done anthropological studies on people who live in Dubai and Singapore. And there's the obvious question at the end of the day. It's like, you live in a fucking dictatorship. You know, do you mind? And they go, what do you mean? I vote with my feet. I've got a plan to leave within 24 hours. If I don't get what I want here in Dubai or Singapore, I just leave. I pack and leave and go somewhere else. And that's exactly what Prospera is open to as well. You, you enter the community. There are a lot of bonuses if you invest in the community. You become a member of the community. Eventually, I think you will develop some kind of elders in the community. Honored members of the community who gave their life to this community. Their wisdom is really priceless to us because that's where we trust them to have the ultimate decisions on how the community is being run. So there's a heritage to the community added to it. That, I think, is the way forward for socracy. And I think those city states that run it that way and keep the door open and say, you're, you're welcome to leave anytime you like, but if you want to stay here, these are the conditions. Yeah, exactly. And you keep that process transparent. Any system that does this today would kill any old political nation state by comparison. You would immediately see that a nation state has enormous bureaucracies. They're really costly. They don't give the citizens what they want. They basically just award work, award jobs and positions to the people of the political class. You don't want that any longer. You want to get out of that. Yeah, exactly. And you correctly said it needs m many nightclubs, right? It needs a many to choose from competition alternatives. If one of them messes up or makes rules that are too strict or too impermissive, then you have alternatives to go to that can satisfy your needs more. And as I think important for the whole movement to succeed, right? If we only had Prospera, that wouldn't work, right? This is why my work is more, or what I'm thinking about is how to spawn a larger movement, right? Where we get more of these jurisdictions, more like Montenegro's, Estonia's, that sort of carve out niches for more players, like to, uh, and more founders that go into these places and start communities and start to build cities or start to build companies in some of these places, right? So, and I think- Exactly. To, yeah, and I think just to gain momentum, we need to at least 10X within the next, um, three to five years, which is very important. Um, then we really yeah. have the momentum to be like uh, an ultimate decentralizing movement that's sort of sort of taking away the bread from the butter of big nations and countries. Well, while Washington, D.C. and Beijing are fighting it out, who's going to be the superpower in the traditional old world, and we're all seeing they have enormous problems, right? Um, mm -hmm. Thankfully, tech has taken off and tech is no longer dependent, though, meaning that most of Chinese tech is now leaving China because you can't do tech any longer in China. You can't even get a fucking chip to whatever you're producing. So you have to get out of China to produce it somewhere else. Now, because nobody trusts the Chinese government, and for that reason, nobody trusts China. So it's not that we don't trust the Chinese. We just want them to leave. <laughs> if they leave, we do trade with them, and we're with them totally, and they're our best friends forever. So they're not, that's not a problem. The, the, it's exactly like you're saying, the opposite of the very idea of empire. Since empire itself is technological, the opposite idea for humans is a city state. I'm still skeptical of network states and that idea. I, I get it. I think Srinivasan is fantastic. His work is partly built on our work. We're like, you know, we work in parallel with developing these ideas for how we can merge technology and, 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 and citizenship and, and, you know, create a wonderful future together. Um, and we want to accelerate into the future as much as we possibly can. We're not, we're not afraid of the future in that sense. I think the, the only threat human beings have against themselves is called the atomic bomb. That needs to be locked up as much as possible, but that's the threat since 1945, and nothing, ev nothing else compares 
climate? No, not at all. The bomb is the problem, right? That's also a problem that's also solved to decentralization because decentralized small city states have no need for atomic bombs. Atomic bombs were always about protecting the borders of the old empires. You know? Yeah, so, it's like so, governments build yeah. nuclear weapons and fir uh, firms build nuclear energy. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exa exactly. You got it. So the, the good side of the pharmacon is nuclear energy and nuclear energy is fantastic. It's, fan it's a fantastic innovation and it's going to get even better and it's going to save us in the future too. I firmly believe that. And nuclear fusion is a design problem, which is exactly what AI is good at. So if you just get, get all the data right, we can we can model a nuclear fusion reactor without costing billions of dollars to build. Right, the companies yeah. that are out there that are doing light water reactors much more cheaply, much more modular. That are doing sort of fuel metal reactors or fusion. Right, it's already right. The only bottleneck is the old world institutions. Right, so it just needs yeah. sort of someone to sort of um, unscrew kind of the valve and let it out out and give it a place where it can go to. Well, the thing is that cheap energy is going to be absolute key for wherever industry is placed in the future. We have yeah. that war in Northern Europe at the moment. The countries that close down the nuclear plants, like Sweden and Germany, are being, beating, being beaten to the ground by countries like Finland and France who decided to build nuclear power. So if you don't have cheap energy available to people, industry will move somewhere else without the jobs and everything else connected to the industry. So the, the, this is the encouragement of building a lot of nuclear energy in the future to complement whatever else you can come up with. But cheap. Abundant, cheap energy is the solution to almost all the major problems of mankind. It, we call it cosmopotamia. Cosmopotamia is the idea that you can drench the world's deserts in water and grow anything you like anywhere. And that idea is tied to the idea of having so much energy, you can actually turn salt water into sweet water whenever you like. That, that, that is just, just a simple calculation anybody can understand in five minutes and then understand where we're heading and where we want to go. But I think city-states are fantastic. I still think that jurisdiction, which is a physical territory, is really good because I believe in grounding. So I am not against capitalism. I love capitalism. I think what capitalism did to world history was fantastic. Yes, we had the nightmare of colonialism and all that, undoubtedly so. But at the end of the day, capitalism took so much bullshit out of human relations because anybody could stand in the street corner and brag about anything they liked. But then capitalism came along and even a kid could go up to somebody and say, yeah, but what's the price? And immediately people were exposed. So people had to be honest in their relations with one another. That's exactly what created the enormous wealth that came out of capitalism over the last 400 years. Now we're moving into Teslaism with the algorithms. All I'm saying, be absolutely honest. Stop lying. Stop hyping. Just tell people you've got a good product and give them a good price and you do okay. Learn from the bazaars of history. My philosophy is not about dictatorships. My philosophy is not about tyrannies. John said it, then I could not care less. Our philosophy is all about trade routes and the beauty of trade routes and the beauty of running a bazaar and how bazaars work when they work. They encourage competition. They're decentralized, but they have a formal system of rules where you enter the door so you get the bullshitters out. You get the sincere people who want to do trade to go in through the door. And when they get inside the bazaar, they can do their trade and they can be successful at it, right? And cherish from it. And that's exactly what we want to do here as well. I think we need to complement the bazaar of the market with a sort of sacred place of attention, which is what we historically did. Every bazaar along the trade routes of the Silk Road, the Silk Road, every bazaar had also a cost which is the origin of monasteries. I'd love to build the Kostag eventually in Prospera. That'd be fantastic. But the Kostag is the place where you go to clean your head from all the nasty, destructive thinking you've done if you didn't do that too well in the bazaar, right? Or if you overdid things and think you're God's gift to mankind because you just had a lucky day, right? So just to get your mind set clearly and have a spiritual mind, you go to the Kostag to meditate. And contemplate. And this is the beginning of the trade route religions. Like How Buddhist. What does modern day Kostak look like? Well, you to build it? because that, I don't believe in the old organized religions like Islam and Christianity. I think they'll all go through secularization and then they will die and wither because we can't have them any longer. I think the trade route religions are the ones to survive. The spiritual schools, the trade routes, like Buddhism, 
Taoism and Zoroastrianism. They're my three favorites, the Persian, the Chinese, and the Indian traditions. And this is the great contribution of the East today, is that they have had religions for thousands of years. They were created long trade routes. They were spiritual schools, and they were not dogmatic. They were just sincere spiritual journeys trying to understand how the world works and especially help you with your own mind to meditate and contemplate properly every day. And this is why having a kastag next to the bazaar is key to civilized society. And the kastag is where we give our sincere attention. In this sense, the market is now submitted to the kastag in a very weird way that we have to explore deeply. I'm not going to jump to any conclusions, but because I don't want my eyes and I don't want my ears to be plundered by somebody I don't like, right? I want, I want to give my attention to things that I'm really devoted to. And if that's what I want to do, then I want to be an eternalist. And if I have enough money to say no to things I don't want to see, or don't want to have around me, then I'm already part of the eternalist elite that says that I have enough money to do okay. I don't have to plunder the earth any longer to make more money or anything like that. I just want to have my freedom. I want my freedom to attend to anything I'm really interested in. If that is the new elite, and if they all go eternalist, then you can't buy them the way you could in the past. And capitalism is then reduced to a basic function beneath that. But capitalism is still there. You know, you still need to eat. You still need to pay rent. You still need to pay my ticket. You know, you know all those issues, you need to pay for those things. And there's an industry operating. There's capitalism operating. It gives people jobs. They go to work, et cetera. The capitalism is still there, the basis. But power ultimately doesn't reside in capitalism any longer. Power now resides in potentials. And there's a yeah. very different world. I love that as a conclusion to this conversation or as like the guiding topic or thought or influence that you brought into this conversation because it's something that i don't think about enough right sort of the spiritual side of it but i love the dialectics of how you put the two together of one is kind of the guiding um principle or the the spiritual or the symbolic power that's attached with it and the other one is kind of just a rationalizing and organizing mechanism like the trade routes the sort of exchanging money, the transactions, the making things work um, aspect of it. So I really love... Which is going to be so easy anyway, because tr transactions are going to happen so quickly and easily anyway with Bitcoin technology and everything. Again, we're seeing decentralization against centralization. My bet here is that the religions of decentralization, the trade of religions will survive and they'll be stronger than ever. We're building more Buddhist monasteries across the Western world than ever before. There are just thousands of them now. Christianity is over and done with. The same thing, again, centralized organizations try to abuse you and follow a religion that they dictate, dogmatic religion, which says that they should be on top and can never be questioned. And that is also in politics. Like, you're not allowed to question the political system, but you're just like, yeah, why would I sit here in a place I don't like or don't get what I want to wait another four years to vote for something that I don't disapprove of anyway in a system that's so fucking rigged that I can't do anything but vote for whoever's in power? Then I'm leaving. I'm getting out of Egypt. I'm going somewhere else where I can mo move my feet and vote with my feet, which is real democracy. Exodology is real democracy. I can leave. I can go somewhere else. And again, this is why I'm betting that the spiritual traditions that were fundamentally pro-decentralization are the ones that will survive because they're the only ones we can take seriously. They rarely talk about a life after death. They all talk about you're going to die one day. Before you die, why don't you live the most meaningful, purposeful life you could have? What does it take to meditate and contemplate and live that kind of life and give that past that tradition on to your children? Those religions, the religions of decentralization will survive. They're religions of centralization that only were big because they had big churches and things like that, or big mosques and organized people to, to go out and work as slaves to the masters. They're overdone with. They will religion not be around. Decentralization. Anymore. I like that. Yeah. Great. Um, Alex, where can people find you and us afterwards? And what is the intellectual deep web? <laughs> we're both on the intellectual deep web. The intellectual deep web happened by accident a few years ago. It's thriving, so much nice stuff coming out of there, heated discussions on everything. You can be left or right or whatever. You can be centralization or decentralization, time, whatever you like. But it's an international network. It used to be North America meets Europe. Now it's just the world. I'm accessible. If you want to find me, you can find me on Facebook. Believe it or not, I'm still around. Maybe because Meta is now doing open source on their AI code or something. Finding Meta is doing something nice. But you know, 
I'm on Facebook. I'm available. You can find me at bardissimo at gmail.com or bardissimo at protomail.com if you prefer, if you're more secret. So bardissimo at protomail or gmail. You can find me there. Uh, just drop me a mail if you want to get connected to these networks. Don't send me long, 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 long service of who you are or try to sell me anything because I hate sales pitches. But if you're sincerely interested in what Nicholas and I are doing and what kind of philosophy we're developing in Prospera, which I think is a fantastic product, if you're interested in these things, contact me or Nicholas and we'll certainly pass you on so you can go on and find the people you're looking for and find the information you're looking for. Alex, it was enormously enriching and I'm very grateful that you've come on this show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Nicholas. And see you soon in Ruatan. Yeah, yeah.